Hi. So today I'd like to talk to you about the three-dimensional infinite potential well problem in quantum mechanics. Now, if you haven't previously seen the one-dimensional infinite potential well problem or the particle in the infinite square well problem in one dimension, then I encourage you to go back and look at that lecture before viewing this one. Okay, so let's get started with the Schrodinger equation in three dimensions. So that would be minus h bar squared times grad squared psi plus v psi is equal to e psi. Now here v is the potential energy, e is the energy of the particle, um, of course m is the mass of the particle confined, and then um, h bar is Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi. Now the grad here, the grad squared, that's the gradient operator, okay, grad is the gradient operator. This often gets covered in calculus 3 courses. It's the first order derivative in three dimensions, so you're taking the partial um, of that wave function psi with respect to each of the um, spatial coordinates, partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z, and then you're adding them up. Now the grad squared or, um, operator is the second order derivative, as is shown here. So you take the partial with respect to x, second order derivative, and then add that up for each of the directions respectively, as shown here in the equation. Now, for the problem of the three-dimensional infinite potential well, basically we're forcing our particle to be confined to a box, okay? So that potential would be that the potential is zero inside the box, so V is equal to zero for inside of the box, and then the potential is equal to infinite, infinity, when it reaches the boundary of the box. And that ensures that the particle cannot escape the box at all. Now, you might guess um, at the solution for the three-dimensional infinite well. And you could do that by looking at what the solution for the one-dimensional infinite well was. And that was the wave function is equal to a times the sine of n pi x over l. Now, a here is the amplitude of the wave function, which for a normalized wave function would end up being the square root of 2 divided by the length of the box l. N is the quantum number or energy level, okay? That is an integer that starts at 1 and goes up from there in integer steps. And of course, L is the length of the boxes we defined. So for a three dimensional well, it would then make sense to guess something like that function, but for three dimensions. And so instead of just sine of n pi x over L, you would also have the sine for the y direction and the z. And so that's our guess. We're going to say that it's an amplitude A, which is undetermined for now times the sine of nx pi x over lx, times the sine of ny pi y over ly, times the sine of nz pi z over lz. Now, the dimensions for the box don't have to be the same initially in the x, y, and z directions. That's why I've indicated the, the lengths as lx, ly, and lz, so that they can be different. Likewise, the quantum numbers don't have to be the same for the x, y, and z directions. That's why I have labeled them nx, ny, and nz. Okay? So that's our guess. Now, plugging that back into the Schrodinger equation, we would have to take the second order partial derivative with respect to each of the spatial coordinates of that wave function. And so if we did that, sorry about that, if we did that, then we would have um, for, for example, for the x direction, we would end up with minus kx squared times that wave function again. Because of course, if you take two derivatives of a sine function um, with respect to x, then you're going to get the sine function again back times some negative constants, okay? Now remember that we have defined k for the one-dimensional problem, k, would be n pi over l. And so for this one, kx would be nx pi over lx. Um, and that makes sense if you think about what the derivative with respect to that would be. So if you take first one derivative, you would have nx pi over lx times a um, cosine then, um, and then for the rest of the wave function it would remain the same. And then if you take another, another derivative, you're going to get the sine function back again. So hopefully that all makes sense to you. If not, make sure to pause the video and make sure that you can understand what those derivatives would be like and that you end up with the same solution that I ended up with. Okay, so plugging that in for the full expression of the Schrodinger equation, then you would have minus kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared times minus h bar squared over 2m times my wave function. And then um, you would have that equal to e psi if you're inside of the well. Remember, because the potential energy v is equal to zero for inside of the well. 
All right, so if you're solving then, you could solve and find E, and E would be equal to pi squared h bar squared over 2m times nx squared over lx squared plus ny squared over ly squared plus nz squared over lz squared. That would be your energy or your energy levels, okay? Also note that if you're used to the other notation, not using the h bar, if, you're, if you'd rather think in terms of um, h, then pi squared h bar squared over 2m would be the same thing as h squared over 8m because h bar is h over 2 pi. Now let's just assume for a second that instead of a box where the dimensions are different in the x, y, and z directions, we have a cube. Okay. In the case of a cube, LX equals LY equals LZ, and just to make things simple, I'll call them all L. Okay, so let's look at what the energies for that particle in the cube would be. So if we're in our ground state, that's the lowest possible energy, then NX, NY, and NZ would all be equal to 1. In that case, you would add it up and get the energy would be 3 pi squared h bar squared over 2 ml squared. That's the lowest possible energy. Okay? That's our ground state. But now let's go to our first excited state. In that case, the next lowest value for the energy would be if one of those quantum numbers was equal to 2 and the other ones stayed at n equal to 1. Now this is perfectly possible. There's nothing that says that um, you have to go up in all of the energy levels at the same time. It's not required, for example, that nx, ny, and nz equal to 2 for the next excited state. Only one of the quantum numbers can jump up. If that's the case, then you're going to get an energy of 6 pi squared h bar squared over 2 ml squared for each of the three cases where nx is equal to 2, or ny is equal to 2, or in z is equal to 2, and the other two quantum numbers are still equal to 1. In other words, you have three different situations that end up giving you the exact same energy. Now, this is known as degeneracy, okay? So, if you look at a quantum system and look at degeneracy, we define a quantum state as degenerate when there is more than one wave function for a given energy. In this case, the wave function would be um, when the sine of n pi x over l, or n pi y over l, or n pi z over l jumps up to n equal to 2 for either one of those three cases. So that does give you three different wave functions because it happens in the one where the sine of n pi x over l would be the one where n equal to 2, or the sine of n pi y over l is the one where n is equal to 2. But you see the wave function is different in each of those three cases. They all give the same energy, so that is a degeneracy. So degeneracy often results from the particular properties of the potential energy function that describes the system. But a perturbation of that potential energy can remove the degeneracy, and then you see splitting of the energy levels. The degeneracy is removed if the potential energy is disturbed. For example, in the hydrogen atom, one way to do that is to apply a magnetic field around the atom. That lifts the degeneracy, and so the energy levels that you see in the absence of that magnetic field change a little bit. And you can see differences in between the degenerate energy states when the magnetic field is turned on. This is known as the Zeeman effect, and we cover this more in modern physics too. Okay? Now, when we speak of degeneracy, we usually talk about how many states share that same energy. So for example, in my previous example of the cube, particle confined to that cube, the first excited state in that infinite square well is threefold degenerate because there's three different wave functions that give the same energy. Okay? Now another thing to think about is that when you look at your Schrodinger equation, however many dimensions you're analyzing, in this case three, you're going to have to have at least that many quantum numbers. So in this case we had nx, ny, and nz, and those were our three quantum numbers. When we go on and do the hydrogen atom, we're going to have the three quantum numbers, because it's a three-dimensional spherical problem, n, l, and m sub l, okay? So it's going to be different depending on what the potential is, right? The quantum numbers might be different, but if you have three dimensions, you have to have at least three quantum numbers. Two dimensions, you'd have to have two quantum numbers, and so on and so forth. So you might want to think about this to yourself, and then in class we'll answer this question. 
what would the next two energy levels be, the second and third excited states, in that three-dimensional cube? All right? So ponder that one, and I'll see you in class.